Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a locomotive in winter, the 1876 offering, poem number four of the 22, From Noon to Starry Nights. Now this one is often anthologized, especially because it's so beautiful when it's read aloud, because it captures the nuances of the old trains as they went across, down the tracks. Now I want to dedicate this poem and the study of this poem and the lecture here to the snow train at uh, Laramie's, uh, Wyoming's Heritage, Railroad Heritage Park. Uh, it is the Union Pacific snowplow of 900015. And man, if you have not seen this, you want to Google it. It is an amazing, amazing uh, train, and especially that huge snowplow on the front. So I want to, I want to dedicate this to this, uh, to this um, train, and uh, it's one of the favorites for my uh, grandchildren to go and, and visit it with me. So we're huge lovers of trains, and so this is a, this is a fun poem in that regard. Now I mentioned 1876 because think about it this way: um, we'll have the Transcontinental Railroad connecting 10 May 1869. So think about 69 to 76 when we have the celebration of, of this, uh, 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 in this poem, the celebration of the locomotive, the train, right? Now our assumptions are that you've been with us at, uh, the ver from the very beginning at learnstrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, our playlist, all the way from the very beginning of the very first word come, all the way up to and including a set of introductory comments for Story Night, and then we just did Mystic Tem uh, Trumpeter. Let's take a look now at what our uh, Norton's has to tell us about this poem. It was first published in a preview of two rivulets in the New York Daily Tribune, February 19th, 1876, before the volume appeared, included without change in its present position in Leaves of Grass, 1881. Fourteen pages of manuscript working notes, trial lines, and rough drafts show the poet's effort to embody his conception. Notes on the intention of the poem include the following, quote, now this is again Whitman, the two ideas of power and motion, twins, dear to the modern, address the locomotive as personally inviting it, ring the bell all through, and blow the whistle. The final manuscript draft actually is in the Boston Public Library, according to Norton's. Although very different as poets, Norton's will say, both Whitman and Emily Dickinson, refusing the romantic posture that science and industry are inimical to the muse, were inspired by the locomotive. We will actually look at Dickinson's I like to see it lap the miles here at the end of our conversation. Now, one of the questions about reading Whitman is always, as we commented in earlier lectures, was he a lover of nature, dalliance of the eagles, or was he a lover of technology? Passage to India comes to mind, or a poem like this. Well, I love that, the, that this poem joins the two ideas together with the single word gyrating, which we'll see here attributed to a train, and of course we saw it in Dalliance of Eagles, right? Um, the train obviously is the emblem for Whitman, and in some ways it will also be representative of him and what he is going through. Now, let's point out there are two parts to this poem. Part uh, Lines 1 through 17 is the first part, and then part 2, uh, 18 through 25, will begin with fierce-throated beauty. So we want to pay attention. And the way in which the poem shifts, even though there's not a numbering system as uh, we see often with Whitman. Now, consider the following. Trains are mentioned a number of times in Leaves of Grass for just a few uh, references. We've got um, a Song of the Banner at Daybreak, we've got A Due to a Soldier, we've got Blade Blue Ontario Shore 5, we've got Passage to India 3. So there's all these references and of course there, there's allusions to the train uh, as it's being, uh, as uh, Lincoln's body is being carried back in, in, in lilacs. Now in uh, the winter of 1875-76, uh, when this poem was being written by Whitman. He was 54 years old, however, he called himself old and shattered. You'll remember the stroke of 1873 he was trying to recover from. And so I think that there is some power to this. He calls it a wretched tea. We'll obviously see it as an apostrophe as we have seen several other apostrophes uh, of, of Whitman's. He'll say it this way. First we've got three these, then we got seven thighs. So he's gonna speak directly to the train, to the locomotive, right? By the way, it's interesting that it's in winter. Let's point that out. V for my recitative. You'll remember, of course, recitative, eight times used in Leaves of Grass. It's that operatic term of half-sung, half-spoken lines. You'll remember it first used in To the Ocause. V for my recitative. V in the driving storm, even as now, the snow, the winter day, declining. Again, think about Whitman and his health. 
thee in thy panoply, thy measured dual throbbing. You'll remember that from Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking, as well as the Lilacs 14. And thy beat convulsive. You'll remember that from Song of Myself 22. Thy black, notice all of the colors that are used. We commented on this again and again in Lisa Grass, but here. Thy black, cylindric body, golden brass, silvery steel, thy ponderous sidebars, parallel and connecting rods, gyrating, shuttling at thy sides. Again, the, the word gyrating to me is the key word here. If you're reading Leaves of Grass as we are from the very first invitation word, and we're seeing connections. So a celebration of, the, of nature in Dalliance of Eagles uses gyrating. A celebration of technology and modernity, and he'll get to the modern in a bit, here in this poem. I think he's trying to bring the two together. Thy metrical now swelling pant and roar, now tapering in the distance. We're going to hear uh, with this word swelling, and we're going to hear several other words there, almost like sexual words, and we'll, we'll make those connections in a bit. Thy great protruding headlight fixed in front, thy long pale floating vapor pennants tinged with delicate purple. Purple's used nine times in Leaves of Grass. It's one of the important times it is. Thy dense and murky clouds out belching from thy smokestack. Now, You'll remember the word belching when he got used in tears, oh, belching and desperate. You'll remember this. Tremulous, um, um, as, as we'll see it in a little bit, will play the game back. And, um, again, it's, it, it almost sounds in some ways like, are we celebrating? Is this, is, this, is this good? I mean, belching is sometimes perceived as not so, not so good. Thy smokestack, thy knitted frame, again, this idea of hugging, clustering, knitting, coming together. Thy knitted frame, thy springs and valves. Obviously, we're celebrating the technology of the locomotive. Humans put this thing together, and look what it can do. Right, um, thy knitted frame, thy springs and valves, thy uh, the tremulous twinkle of thy wheels. Tremulous is used in pet up game rivers, but there, of course, it's more sexual. It's fascinating the way he plays the game with the words. Thy and then for the first time and only time in the poem, locomotive never actually gets used in this poem. It's train. Thy train of cars behind, obedient. So for Whitman, he's always he always sees everything as synodos, right? He always sees it as. Somehow representative, right? Uh, thy train of cars behind obedient, merrily following. To consider, of course, that joy, joy, all over joy was the last line of the preceding poem. So you can kind of see why these poems maybe are stacked the way they are. He says it this way. Through gale or calm, now swift, now slack. Do you hear this rhythm, right? Almost ch-chum, 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 ch-chum. I'll read it again. St uh, children love this poem for this reason. They love it when I just read it and I don't say anything about it. Through gale or calm, now swift, now slack, yet steadily careening. You can hear all of that, all those rhythms. Type of the modern. Go back to the very first poem. I told you guys, as we come to the end, we come back to the beginning. Um, that circular kind of understanding. And of course, uh, trains make us think circularly, don't they? Back to the very beginning, the very first poem, One Self I Sing. You remember the very last line of that first poem was The Modern Man I Sing, and here we are. Um, um, the, the idea of type of the modern, and then the dash. Emblem of motion and power, and then the dash. Pulse of the continent. And again, go back to the Intercontinental Railroad that will finally come together uh, at a Promontory Summit in Utah, 10 May 1869. Some have argued in their study of American thought, American history, that really it is the train more than any single thing that will change forever, more than even the repeating rifle, that will change forever what America will become. And I think Whitman was kind of onto something as he saw this. I think he was celebrating it at the same time. Tremulous gives the sense of, uh, we're not quite sure. For once, now all of a sudden the shift in the poem. For once come serve the muse, notice capitalized, obviously the invocation is here. And merge in verse, even as here I see thee. With storm and buffeting gusts of wind and falling snow, this is his theodicy. Why does bad? Why is it that such bad things? Why is so much pain got to come to me? By day, thy warning ringing bell to sound its notes. By night, thy silent signal lamps to swing. Think about the fact that this is a poem that's set in a cluster called noon to starry night. And then go back and read those lines again. Now that's the conclusion of part one. Part two begins with fierce throated beauty exclamation point. And we now move from the train as something physical to now the train as representative, emblematic of his poetry and what he's hopeful will happen. By the way, think about the power of the use of the word fierce 
in Leaves of Grass. You could argue it's one of Whitman's favorite words. 28 times it's used, or some version of it in Leaves of Grass. Throated beauty, the idea that it is beautiful, it's technology, but it is beautiful. Roll through my, notice the power of roll, roll through my chant with all thy lawless music, thy swinging lamps at night. Hear all the L sounds there. Lawless music, again, I told you guys, and from noon to starry night, it's always about reconciliation of these paradoxes, right? The, um, thy madly whistled laughter, we heard, of course, about laughter in the last poem in Mystic uh, Trumpeter, part eight. Rumbling like an earthquake, rousing all. Rumbling gets used one time in all these of grass, and it's right here. I think, guys, this is the only simile in the poem, isn't it? Notice, he doesn't want to compare the locomotive or the train to anything using the words like or as except here. And notice, it is disruptive, earthquake, and then it is a, like a bell, an alarm bell, rousing all, waking up. And then he uses the word law. And the way he's used the word law, I've argued, I think he learned it from his study of Virgil's Aeneid sex. When Aeneid and his father Anchises are down in the underworld, we're given full lectures at Learnstrong. Yeah, but you'll remember that. He said, uh, Anchises told his son, the Romans will be known primarily because they will be distributors of law. So here it is. Law of thyself complete. We've heard this several times about being a law unto yourself. Law of thyself complete, thine own track firmly holding. I told you guys this motif of holding clustering. I think he learned it from his study of Milton's Paradise Lost in those very last lines that we read long, long ago when we were messing around at the beginning of Lisa Grass as Adam and Eve are leaving Eden in paradise, holding each other's hands. And then in parenthetics, for one line, he says about his verse and the locomotive as the modern, no sweetness debonair of tearful harp or glib piano thine. His recitative will be something robust, something rumbling, something tremulous. That is to say, something that's waking up, right? Everything, something gyrating, all right? Thy trills, you'll remember that word from Song of Myself 13, of shrieks, only use, and all these aggress of that word is right here. By rocks and hills returned, and those of us who love to you know, go on, especially the old trains, when they go through those canyons, like, for example, the canyon outside of Thermopolis, right, between Shoshone and, and Thermopolis, and the trains go through, and those of us that have either been on those trains or close to those trains, they echo off of the rocks. It's, it's, it's kind of wonderful. That notion of echoing takes us, obviously, back to Shelley's Ode to the West, Wind 5, no question. We've given full lectures. So you want to go back and run that to ground. Thy trills of shrieks by rocks and hills return, Launched over the prairies. We've seen launch so many times in Leaves of Grass uh, as, as an important word for us, right? Launched over the prairies, again, the prairies central, right? Wide across the lakes to the free skies, unpent. You'll remember this unpent in first those songs and drum taps, unpent enthusiasm, and glad and strong. Um, it's, it's clear that Whitman is going to celebrate the locomotive as what he hopes his verse will be. And the last word I think is significant, strong. Now what are we going to say about this text? Well, I think a 2A. We're going to argue that technology is the symbol of the modern, no question, but it's also the symbol of Whitman's poetry, or what he hopes it to be. That is to say strong. I think the key word in this regard is rumbling. There, there's a, it's such a wonderful word, rumbling, right? It's got that kind of, it's kind of got that cadence to it already that makes this poem have a sense of, well, like trains on tracks, no question. At 2B, the rhetorical significance of this poem has not been lost on any number of, of thinkers. Um, consider, for example, the assonance, serve, merge, buffeting, gusts, the alliteration, pale, vapor, pendants, purple. Consider the iambic movement, some even call it a thrust, Thy black cylindric body, golden brass and silvery steel, like ba boom, ba boom, we, we pointed that out. The the, the um, systolic and and diastolic uh, rhythm of this text is to me fascinating. I love it. I, I I love to read this poem, especially to children, out loud. At three a, we mentioned it, so let's enjoy it. Um, um, I like to see it lap the miles. Poem three eighty three of Emily Dickinson's offering. I like to see it lap the miles and lick the valleys up and stop to feed itself at tanks and then prodigious 
step around a pile of mountains and supercilious pier and shanties by the sides of roads and then a quarry pair to fit its sides and crawl between complaining all the while in horrid hooting stanza then chase itself downhill and nigh like boningers then prompter than a star stop docile and omnipotent at its own stable door is it possible that after talks with Walt, we do chats with Emily? I'm beginning to think so. It's brilliant, isn't it, to be able to compare the two poems by America's two greatest poets. I'm sorry, but let's just say it out loud. I don't know that anybody's ever done it better than Emily and Walt. Finally, at 3B, how about you? Um, and how are we going to own a poem like this? Do you love trains? I hope that you do. Um, if you do, what's your favorite? And if you don't have a favorite, then maybe go find one so that way you can uh, pay attention to it. And the next time you're traveling out west, visit Laramie and, uh, and visit the uh, Railroad Heritage Park and the depot there. Just enjoy it and go on the bridge up above where me and my, uh, my grandkids like to stand and, and watch the trains as they come in and I can tell them stories about where all those trains are going. It's wonderful. Finally, what is your favorite symbol of technology? Maybe it's your phone, right? Okay. For those of you who have the Apple product with a bite taken out of an apple to remind us of not only our Milton, but now obviously our leaves of grass. How about your favorite symbol of the modern might just be that collection you're holding in your hands right now, leaves of grass. Thank you.